welcome everyone. It's so nice to see in the comments. Uh, that's a pretty global audience that we have here. So welcome. Uh, my name is Anne Milan Allo. I am the VP of Creative for SiriusXM and Pandora. If you're not familiar with those two brands, um, SiriusXM is a legacy radio, satellite radio, and uh, now we've evolved into also a streaming app. Pandora is also a music app. So if you listen to Apple Music or Spotify, it's very similar to that. Um, but my role here at SiriusXM is that uh, I lead up a creative studio of about 100 plus creatives of motion, photo, video, graphic design, creative directors, writing. And we are in charge of developing most of the marketing that you see out in the wild um, on behalf of our talents. So that could be music, talk, um, and entertainment. And a little flavor is I just came back from Super Bowl, which I believe is now a, sort of a global event that folks are watching all over the world. Um, and what we did there is that um, we do broadcast live because we have sports channels. So we do all the promotions for that. In addition to a concert with Maluma, which was really awesome. So my team is involved in developing all the creative assets for that. Well, Adam, Follow that. What a, what, a, uh, what an amazing resume. And uh, yeah, Adam, please. Introduce Always yourself. humbling, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, you do all the cool stuff. I just sound sound like I do a lot of stuff because yeah. it's all, the cool well, stuff. Um, yeah, um, I lead uh, the creative for um, Giant Cookie, which is an experiential uh, marketing company. We, we do everything from ideation, um, um, all the concepts, all the strategy uh, for for all sorts of events, um, mainly pretty large ones, and um, we do everything from also activations, interactions, staging, the whole thing, up to the uh, the final execution and uh, and production. Um, we work all over Europe for lots of different brands, um, and been doing this for for a bit for a while. Have a um, sort of decentralized network of uh, creatives uh, of all sorts that work all around the world. Uh, we went for that model after after COVID and, um, and it's actually proving really, really good um, because we're managing to, to work ac across different time zones and maximizing that, that aspect pretty well too. Um, on the other hand, uh, as uh, as we started working with uh, AI and AI uh, tools um, for creativity, we started seeing that there was a um, there was an ongoing debate on in this field um, about how it was going to really impact each of the uh, creative verticals uh, across creativity as a whole. And um, with uh, between Giant Cookie and uh, the Carrot Collective, which are our partners, a uh, similar agency to us. We created I Create, which is uh, a global series of events that um, uh, have the objective of um, of speaking about the impact, the current impact of AI, and the impact that uh, AI will have in our in our fields, in our creative fields. Um, we're we're doing we've already done six different countries, and we've got uh, uh, this year really booked up. Uh, in, in many different uh, locations, talking about specific um, uh, creative verticals. So um, uh, my role there is to curate and to also help in the, um, in the sort of creative direction that the whole project uh, takes, which is super fun uh, because we get to, to work with a lot of, of uh, AI creators as well as more traditional creators while we talk about um, how this is impacting creativity. So um, yeah, learning a lot in each of these events and trying to take it on and, and also adopt uh, all these uh, new findings to what we do at Giant Cookie as well. Well, we have, thank you both. We've got probably uh, a thousand things we could cover. I'm going to try my best to uh, shepherd this and uh, keep us so we can give some, you know, some insights and some value to the audience. Please ask questions. Uh, we will try and get to them um, as we can. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to start with you, Anne, because you have a very large team, a very large remit uh, in a very large industry. 
and um, you may have different challenges than kind of a small lean startup that is willing to kind of move fast and break things. And so how are you looking to kind of scale out potentially strategies, uh, initiatives within your teams to promote generative AI, if you even think that's a good thing? And like, how, what's your approach to this? Because you've got a lot of people to uh, look after as well. Yeah, for sure. Before I start, I'm just going to give a shout out to a SiriusXM listener who I believe <laughs> Megna is referring to BPM channel. So shout out to Megna for um, some SiriusXM love. It's one of our um, BP, I guess it, it's, it speaks for itself. It's dance music, BPM. Um, and so, yeah, why don't we go to slide four, uh, which I think is super helpful just as a ground grounding. So I can definitely answer the question, but because we have a large audience today and not sure if everyone was with us with the prompt, to me, there's it's a pretty complex introduction to, first of all, talk about generative AI and be responsible as a leader. Oftentimes it could be like, we're gonna take on AI, cool, we're gonna modernize. But uh, if you don't have your team brought along with you, especially those that are involved in the skill of a craft that might be uh, impacted, um, I would like to say is that you have to really have an understanding of what the phases are. And I learned the hard way having gone through this um, different ways prior to this role. I was also at Netflix. And so um, while that was a fluent team, a team prior to that also was a little bit more like new to, let's just call it like generative AI and the emerging technologies. So what I've illustrated here is sort of a soft introduction on how I brought my team along so that I could really empower adoption of generative AI. Now I won't spend a lot of time here, but these are the nine phases, which I'll probably refer to as we have this open discussion. Um, what you see on the right side is mid journey. I think some folks use other things, but it was more of a casual introduction of these are actual folks on my team engaging with their own portraits. And so the first thing is introduction, which is psychological safety. So you have to make it super friendly and also like not a mandate. Of course, if you're a creative, you're gonna be like, oh shit, like somebody's gonna take my job or what does this mean for me? So then the second thing is job security, fear and curiosity. And I really underscore fear because as a leader, if you don't understand that there's a natural fear that comes along with introducing this while you're currently working in a specific role that could be hugely impacted, um, I, I'm not so sure you'd be as successful in adoption. The third thing would be exploration and inspiration. So allow them to play with the tools and then have them decide how it's complementary. So I specifically use the term tech assist. Oftentimes it's like AI, a robot's gonna come replace a job. That's really, not, if you really work in AI, you know that's not really the full story. Um, but sometimes like saying it to a team is not sufficient. And so it's really important that you allow your teams to explore and then find their own inspiration of like, oh, this is so cool. I uncovered this, this and that. And I'll show some examples later. Then the fourth thing is like, then it actually settles in. Job security, satisfaction, and openness. If you skip over all these four things, it's really hard to get to a place of your teams testing and learning with the tools, unlocking the benefits of AI of all different kinds, whether it's generative AI, assembly, et cetera, et cetera. And then what recently my team has gone through, which is analysis paralysis. And I don't know if Adam probably has a different take on this, which is because we're a large team and because we are such a high volume and also complex, at any given moment in time, my team is working on 200 plus projects. And these all go into the market. So we have to be highly responsible of A, the volume of work to make sure it doesn't um, become a risk legally for with licensing rights and et cetera. Um, it's really hard to figure out like what is a tool and or what is the process or is it a feature set in Adobe? Is that enough? Is that modern enough? If not, so that's really where my team has been in the last year. Um, now we're in a place of like slow adoption. Now that we've sort of learned the hard way, it's taken a whole year to like play around with tools and still we don't know which one's the best one. It's like the project management tool. There's so many out there, but then you don't really know which one solves all your problems. And the reality is none of them do. So it's a matter of just like, what is the best one? Then you go into full integration, which I hope to accomplish this year. 
I'm crossing my fingers. And then nine is really hand in hand with everything else, which is ethics, which I know we'll touch upon later. So hopefully that gives you a little flavor into like, I wish it was a turnkey switch, but it really is not. Oh, I mean, uh, such a great articulation of a complex challenge. And it's that, that, I mean, that messy middle part of, oh, I can see, I can see a possibility of a future here, but all of those things. And, you know, generally creatives are really good at problem solving uh, and problem solving in their own areas. But that analysis paralysis, I think is especially compounded at the moment. There's, you know, the, the 15 new tools a week, mm -hmm. it's kind of different to, you know, Adobe releasing a cadence of, oh, we've just had a new like widget added to the toolbar. Should mm -hmm. we go check it out? That's a very different thinking and discussion to like, which one of these 27 things are going to solve my problem and which one of them are still going to be in business next week and which one of them are going right. to start charging double. So like there is the, the challenge is real. I think for even the most flexible minds, like the challenge is real there. Um, Adam, I'd love to kind of hear your perspective um, from a different point of view of how you would kind of categorize the areas like within creativity and design that you could potentially use in workflows. Like what, where, where are you seeing traction? Where are you seeing, well, not necessarily low hanging fruit, but like where, where, where's the opportunities that you're seeing here? I think, um, at least in in, in my field, um, you know, in the you have like the sort of open plane of when you're uh, the first sort of brainstorming sessions, the first ideation um, sessions, and I think there's a variety of tools which have really made that process a lot more agile. In terms of um, you know, before maybe you know, it would be a mood board, it would be reference videos, it would be cool things people had seen that would be brought into a session. That's still happening, but the, a large percentage of that now is, uh, wait a minute, I, I can create this in a second. Let me just do a quick mid journey. Actually, just throw it in, into runway. Let's make a little video out of it. Uh, I've done a little lip sync on this. Uh, I've got the, you know, so that... And I feel that creatives tend to work very well in, in teams bouncing off each other. So if you cut the time between producing something shareable that someone can bounce from, it, the process becomes a lot faster and, and it's like, a, like an engine. Yes. It, it, it becomes really, um, yeah, it, like you go from 80 horsepower to 500 horsepower in terms of... Uh, boom, 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 you start bouncing the ideas off. I call that, well, it's the, like the sort of open plane of ideas. And then then you go into the closed plane where you need to bring them down to earth. I'm, and I'm that's not trying to cut you short, Adam, but I just think there's a there's something that you land on there um, is the cycle time between mm -hmm. having an idea and communicating that idea, like, you know, could be super long. And sometimes you lose creative momentum in that cycle time as in like, man, I just want you to understand what's in my head so you can see what's in my head. So I can, you know, that, that going from a day to an hour. Absolutely. And, and we know time is, is never infinite in, in briefs and the delivery times never. So, so all that time is actually time that allows you for, you know, like uh, uh, a, a lot more potential, I feel, you know, um, to come up with, with better or more fun ideas just means that the creatives on the, on the team become more creative. Um, and so in that area, in the ideation um, phase, definitely, I, I see it's, uh, it's changed uh, the way we work completely. Um, and then in in translating that to the design and architecture team that needs to bring down that crazy mid journey idea to something actually that's structurally safe that's uh, doable that's within budget etc no? um and then so uh, the designers on, on our team has, have also come back to us saying that they really uh, are are really enjoying this process because before again you get they get a mood board uh, and that mood board, they could maybe take a part of a reference, part of another reference, but 
maybe it wasn't the part of the reference you wanted them to take uh, uh, for it. So Midjourney actually helps home down what they need to translate, which gives them at the same time more time and more leeway to come up with alternatives and new ideas that is still stemming off the branch you want them to take. No? So uh, so I think it's it's really affecting most of, of the process, even a step back, which is the brief, coming up with the analyzing briefs and breaking them down into the, the, the most important action points. Um, but yeah, uh, I think it's definitely affecting every area, even presenting to, to the client. Uh, we do mood videos uh, with, with Runway with Pika, and those are working very well uh, to, to communicate as opposed to they'll still get their 50 pager uh, proposal, but if they need to escalate um, a, a decision to other stakeholders in the company, it tends to work better to have a really cool mood video that they can say, this is what we're doing, more or less. And, and that, that works very well too. You Adam, kind of a follow-up yeah. question, just from a technical standpoint, because I don't do a ton of, um, well, yet, I guess, video. Is there is a render time long? Because I know it's like fast to maybe generate, but is the render time also fast? Um, it's, it's relatively fast. You get uh, a runway video in about 60 seconds. But you get four per, seconds per four, per four seconds, yeah, huh? and per four seconds, right? Sixty yeah. seconds per four seconds, roughly. Exactly. Oh, I see. And, I see. Okay, got it. And then runway, admittedly, is still still a wild horse. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you will need probably about five to ten, and I'm being conservative here, five to ten iterations until you get something that get, you know. Wow, that's great. Mm. No one's morphed into a column <laughs> or something, <laughs> yeah. something that doesn't make sense. And I think that's that's the big challenge is um, for for to achieve something that, that looks natural, if that's your your objective. But it's trial and error, and uh, it's super fun too. So I think uh, it's one of those things you watch a couple of tutorials and, and you're ready. The, the, the way to, I think, to frame it, coming back to creative processes and maybe then we should like touch on tools because tools are fun tools are tools are tangible and, and fun as well but um i really love to look at it as like a non-deterministic creative process and by that i mean i i lean into the chaos and if you start to lean into the chaos of like runway might give me something i do not expect and the <laughs> journey will definitely give me things i do not expect um and to have like an open mind of going, actually, maybe I'm not entirely the author of all of my work that I should be letting some things like kind of flow from it. As in like, I know what I want to convey. There will be 17,000 different ways I can convey that. And if you, if you lean into the randomness, the process is pleasant. If you are like super control is in like i want pixel the pixel to go over there and i want this render to be like in the, like then it kind of gets really frustrating. frustrating really really frustrating really quickly because you, you can't so you know the the interesting thing and i'll ask this about the, like your kind of creative team um and like the interesting thing here is that creatives that know how to do this the traditional way to do that that have honed their craft sometimes see this differently to someone that may not know how to do it they're like oh my goodness suddenly i can now make a thing that i couldn't used to make but to a designer that could have has always been able to make it but maybe in a different way do you see that tension within like um people that you know that's their role they're probably part of their identity as well is like the way that they make do you see that as something that is like within that kind of fear um, or just, you know, within those kind of that matrix that you've kind of put forward at the beginning, is that something that you've noticed at all? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a combination of a few of them, meaning like there is some curiosity and fear. I think it's probably a cocktail of both. Like, hmm, I wonder what I can do with this. But then also like, am I helping the cause of my job being obsolete? <laughs> um, and then my favorite part is when there's, an unlock and the unlock to me is less about like can I do something faster from a traditional sense or 
uh, can I finally do two clicks to achieve something that used to take me like, you know, two days to ideate and et cetera, like almost like a, a fast mood board. It's almost like a, a magic eight ball mood board is what I would call it, which is like you sort of do this imagining thing and then boom, like it's out there or it's now a conversation. Like the mood board used to be really flat. Like I'm pulling a photo or I'm pulling scrap images to create something and it's not a conversation with an in with a creative lens. It's like whatever I put together is whatever I put together. Now it's like I have this thought, whatever you want to do, text to image. And then you're like, oh shit, I didn't think about it that way. And so that's where I think it's really hard to conceptualize without trying the evolution of the creative process. So that's one aspect. Then the second part is there's a practical unlock also, which only, in my mind, only creatives who understand the business probably will use as a solve, which my assumption is what most enterprises want, feel like is a benefit of modernization of AI. Um, hang on, let me pull up a slide. I'm gonna jump around here. Uh, let's go with like slide 10. Actually, let's start with slide nine. This is an interesting one. I'm sure Diane is listening. Yeah. Furiously typing away. Thank you. All right. So slide nine. I mean, okay, cool. Um, and this is in Firefly. And what you see down below basically is for most of our channels, if you listen to some of our channels, we have a fixed definition of what it is. So this is high powered new hard rock that's loud, uncensored and connected to the people who love it. We copy and pasted it into the text to image to see what comes up. And look, it's not it's not too far. I mean, is this the colorway? No. Is it like overly like a bit comical? Yes. But it's not distant. So would ha would a different person would have found that possibly but i do think like creatives who are both in the business and understand the craft and have a common understanding of like what they're playing with could use quick solutions like this like oh what if we just put the actual prompt of each channel in there and see what we get can we go to the next slide which is 10. and then there's another one which is like this is a sears xm hits one logo a legacy logo and oftentimes it's a lot of discussion of like, what if we change it? What if we do this? Some folks are very purist. Some folks are very precious. Some folks just want to change it every all the time. So this is another iteration of just give us a California vibe, a humorous vibe, a psychedelic vibe, just to play around with it. <clears throat> so this is the outcome of what I think a person who's actually versed in the skill set and the craft play around. I don't know if a non-designer would I mean, probably if you're curious, but I, I, I would beg to differ that maybe the thinking of how to play with it might not be as direct as something like this. Uh, I mean, I probably have a huge amount of confirmation bias because I am only surrounded by creatives and designers. And so the people that I've worked with with generative AI uh, have only become more no, powerful is the wrong word because it sounds like a superpower but they, i mean maybe that they've only become more valuable um i i could i can't necessarily i can't correlate between someone that wouldn't have like essentially like good art direction good conceptual thinking kind of good fluid thinking or like just you know the, all, all of the personality traits that are associated with great design i can't necessarily say that ai doesn't give you those <laughs> it gives you the ability to make things it doesn't necessarily give you the ability to judge it and to understand what how it aligns to anything else that sits outside of the prompt yeah uh, just I, I haven't seen it May, i could be wrong but i have a good it. benefit to your point so let's, let's just call it like creative direction you know um an understanding of like the true art and science based on what the brief is but we all if I'm speaking to mostly creatives, have been in that seat where it's like, can you do this? Can you do that? And you already know the calculation in your head that like that is not the creative solve. So part of that last thing, which is like the hits one colorways, that is almost a gift because you could just give that to your partners and just say, look, 
here's what it looks like in a bunch of different colors. You tell me if it looks good or not. And they're like, oh yeah, you're right. Like we don't need to butts with the color every single time. So that's sort of a, on the flip side, almost a gift in which you can use it, not necessarily for a final product, but fat, you don't have to spend time making the ugly thing to just prove that it's ugly, you know? That's amazing. <laughs> I, I don't think you should change that logo, by the way. I really like it. I think uh, everything everything comes back around <laughs> if you just wait long enough. Yep. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Adam, on like kind of tools and educating teams, I know that you're kind of like testing and playing sort of approach, yeah. um, but let's try and narrow this down. Choosing tools, I think this is one of a really hard thing. Choosing tools, getting people started. Um, is there any kind of actionable things that you ha that have worked uh, in terms of like, this is the direction we're going to go. This is what we're going to do with a tool or do you not approach it that way? Um, I, I agree with what Anne mentioned before and it's, uh, I think making it fun, making it um, playful. It's like go out there, go wild on AI tools, come back and report what works, what's too much, mm, too technical to, uh, or what uh, what's too crazy that comes back with results that you didn't really want uh, and, and what's really effective. You know? And I think as you, as you Phil uh, mentioned before, every week there's something new. And it, it sounds like before we used to, I think we said that in an exaggerated way. Now it's literally, you know, like last week we had Sora. Yesterday, Pika uh, launched Lip Sync, which is a total game changer. Absolutely like mind blowing kind of uh, storytelling tool, which we could make videos before. And now we can make videos that talk uh, and in the texts and in the way that we want them to. It's still gonna be glitchy. It's still gonna be iffy, but it's already here. It, which means it's the worst it will ever be. That's what, the thing I say exactly. like four times, That's... four times a day. Whatever you're seeing right now is like the scrappiest version of of it, and it will definitely only get better. Exactly. So, I mean, on uh, specifically on tools, um, we we are working with 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 our own GPT. We've uh, we've been training and we continue training our own uh, GPT and G on on ChatGPT. So we we trained it on giant cookies, um, um, presentations, uploaded lots of PDFs, decks, um, copies, everything that we've been doing in the last year, uh, uh, pretty much. So it would understand our language. It would understand the way we break down presentations, briefs, um, strategies, etc. We've trained it on on um, advertising uh, gurus. We've trained it on basically anything that we think will reinforce uh, um, reinforce it as as a really valuable tool to that can then give us the outputs that we were hoping to to achieve. So that's that's been really helpful as a tool, and that's ongoing. We're we're doing the same now with. Um, yeah, I, I create the platform uh, I was uh, talking about before, where we're actually training with a different tool. It's called Twice, um, and they uh, basically it's a, a new company that what they do is they create a sort of clone of you or of a character, and um, you their their machine learning is very very customized. So what we're doing is giving transcripts of all the talks that we've been giving over the last year to uh, to our sort of pink fluffy Yeti um, character, which is our our sort of um, mascot. That's no uh, way to talk about your business partner. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you wouldn't be impressed. Um, so uh, he's called Yai, and Yai is now being trained to with all the all these talks. So eventually, and he can talk back to you because he's got vo uh, voice recognition. This is actually, um, yeah, um, some of the uh, of the posts we've done with Yai, and uh, he's he's got a little movie as well, and 
we're giving him more and more uh, of a leading role in our communications, and he's going to be a spokesperson for for iCreate. Um, but now uh, we'll be able to talk to him, and he'll be able to talk back. And we're also going to, going to involve Yai in some of the uh, panel discussions on on the events. So once he's got enough um, information, we'll be able to include him within the debates as another panel member. But that's that's I think uh, oh, cool. some, some way to to go. No. So that, yeah. so going back to the tools, yes, um, GPT, uh, Claude for also for um, for copy. Then we use Midjourney uh, really religiously, more as a sort of uh, text to image, image to image as well. Um, we use Runway primarily for um, for video, although some people use Pixverse or Pika. Um, uh, we use um, where else are we using Eleven Labs if we need um, voice, DNID for lip sync. Um, if we need any of that, uh, if we need someone narrating over over a video, um, Crea has been K R E A. Has uh, it's it's kind of it seems quite basic, but then you see it's actually super useful because you can you've got two screens, so you can upload an image of your set, for instance, and on on your tablet or or even with your mouse, you can draw over it, and with a prompt and the screen next to it, it'll, it will translate your squiggles into something photographic or uh, in the style that you've defined. And that's really, really fast. And then what we do sometimes is actually take those Crea images and throw them back into, um, into Midjourney again. So uh, I, I've actually got uh, a little video of, of the processes that we used for one of the, um, the events we did uh, late last year. Uh, I think it's on slide 14. I think, um, uh, Diana, would you be able to play that one for, for us? Pretty much a little bit how we we use it. Now we're using it a lot also for activations, so designing the actual activations, and that's happening as I was saying with Crea quite a lot. It's, that would be a bit of a breakdown of what we do. I love your work; it's always so good. Um, the I guess one thing I you know there's a lot of words there in terms of like product names, and this is probably one thing that I would say is a, a very common theme is that it is not just one magic box tool it's 17 and it's it's finding out where in the process to align them into and maybe it's not 17 it's 17,000 but whatever you know having so that sweet if you reframe that to like when has it ever been a better time to be a creative because you've now got so many new tools at your fingertips for when forever it's basically been like a couple of major providers and now it's like it's wild west and it's scary but that is a whole world of opportunity within every single one of those things um and i want to we're gonna probably but a few more we're gonna have to get some audience questions i want to do two things firstly i would love your take on open ai sora which kind of blew up a couple of weeks ago um in terms of full coherent generative AI video and like where, you know, cause that shook the foundations, I think of a few industries. So we'd love your take on that. 
and then maybe we should uh close out between us uh with some audience questions but also ethics a little bit as well when we're coming to these things because the foundation shaking also leans into some maybe some slightly more difficult questions um to talk about but what's your take on firstly like that felt like a moment in time when it when that happened uh, Anne, please um I'd, I'd love to hear your opinion yeah um well it, it's a little bit one of those things where i envy adam because i'm in a highly corporate environment we want to chase all the cool things um but we have a lot of responsibility like internally so it's when i get torn apart which is there's a side of me that just wants to go i mean internally the, our team is called creative lab so have almost given us the license to experiment but i have finite resources time the business is demanding so to find time to really give it its full breath is really hard um so that's where i get torn where i'm like i wish i was in a smaller boutique agency where i could just have a creation like yai you could see where i'm much more practical in the way that i'm showing my examples um but as a creative in general, if I was to take that away from like my actual role today and then just as an ambassador of creativity, I think it's a really cool time. If you can overcome your fear, I think you can you you can really get to a place of like, oh, like there's so much I can do. But um, I don't know if this group is involved or has the book, but, you know, Phil and I geeked out over our friend Rick Rubin's book and I've used that to remind me that you got yours there adam as well yeah so I like, just it to, to, to people in my team as well yeah i feel crazy because it's like i i it's almost like my blankie like i cannot leave without it like wherever i go i go on vacation i go to the coffee shop i go to work like it's just always next to me and my takeaway is that it is a really super cool time to be a creative to have tactile things but also like really 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 mind-blowing digital technologies in every craft uh so that's why i think i carry that book around is it gives me license to go like meta creative even though i'm in a highly corporate world so that's sort of my like loose take on it that's awesome um adam i'm gonna ask you you've been having some um global conversations in loads of different fields and you must have gained like seen a lot of on the ground sentiment what's your kind of personal oh well take on like qualms worries ethical concerns like within this field like the creative possibilities new unlocks i think we're all in alignment that there is a lot of upside mm -hmm. and we can explore that upside where like what where's your kind of barometer on the more challenging areas of like okay bias i think it's a big question <laughs> bias yeah yeah they're, they're big yeah um i i'd like to just um um add something to what ann was just uh, mentioning Please go ahead. um and then then i'll i'll go on to on to those more challenging questions which i think um and for me i am uh, i mean I, admittedly my agency's Tiny next to the the, the the volume and the the size that you have um, uh, that you have and I um, what I but what I have found with with AI tools is that I've come back to being a creator uh, and not only having the vision and um, so I it's probably been my, one of my most I feel more productive years in terms of creativity, because even on a personal level, I, I this year I published a book uh, with with the help of AI. I've done a short movie, um, working on 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 a play. These are things which I didn't a I didn't have time for, and and b I didn't even have the sort of mental bandwidth for. And now these these ideas, things that maybe I can put together in a weekend and I my my recommendation if uh, in in that sense would be just dive in on whenever you have free time with them because they're just for fun because uh, uh, it, it 
brings you back to to trans, you know translating that vision to 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 actually uh, without the need of anyone else at that given moment just to to uh, and i think that fun aspect is uh, at least for me it was the reason i went into this industry um i'm, I'm gonna that's amazing dude i've uh, but, like you i forgot to i forgot to say like the the i like personal projects that i don't send anywhere i, like, I just do them just i do them just me the the one like the reason that that's there the book is like it, it is it is personally my sanctuary i was saying oh it's this, I don't know if we actually properly said it. It's like it's Rick Rubin's The Creative Act. It is just yeah, like folks are it's, asking. It's, so, yeah. it's uh, an absolute Bible. I'm um, making my way through it and visualizing the, the kind of um, kind of narrative concepts that I see in text and trying to put like a visual framing from it. And it's like this. It's like quite this like weird meditative like therapy <laughs> to me. But I'll like take something that I'm trying to um, like learn a tool or technique, but use the book as the thing, as like just go to a chapter, take an idea, see if I can translate that idea from some from one format into another format. It's like there's this, um, I think Brian Eno, who's another creative powerhouse, uh, has this these things called the oblique strategy cards where they kind of just prompt you to think in different ways. And like, I, like just even that in and of itself, can I take something that exists in text and make it into something visual? Can I take something visual? Can I make it exist in text? Like these are just really simple personal mm -hmm. strategies. Um, but yeah, I, I love both of those answers. I'm going to, I'm going to push on you though, Adam. Okay. And I'm going uh, to, I, I want to know, I want to know where you feel on the other side of the, of the argument as well. Well, um, I mean, for starters, there's a, there's a, I, I feel there's a big, pushback from when right, we've done um, events speaking about the impact of AI in, uh, in the publishing world, in the advertising world, uh, architecture, film, um, art, uh, fashion. Next month we'll be in Miami doing um, the impact on art education. Then we'll be in Warsaw um, con for content creators. And uh, and it goes on. It goes on. We've got some more in Singapore and in, in um, other locations in Asia as well. And one of the things I think you know is is an ongoing um, situation is the pushback from many practitioners. Uh, there's even yeah, and you'll see it on. I think everyone sees uh, on Instagram. You know, someone posts something that's been created with AI, and there's a there's People threatening to unfollow accounts from from magazines, from uh, art fairs, from and it's um, it, it's a reality, and I think uh, it it it's a combination also of um, you know the the fear that it's it's going to take away many jobs. Um, there's also I think from from these talks uh, an understanding that. I think you know it's a cliche now, but uh, it's not AI is not going to take your your job away. It's going to be other people using AI that might take your job away if you don't jump on the on the AI train. Um, it's a cliche, but I think the way things are going, from what I'm, uh, I've been seeing, it's probably a reality. Uh, mm, creatives around different verticals are being supercharged with AI. They're becoming faster more agile, being able to uh, to produce higher quality outputs in less time. So competing with that without AI is going to be challenging, to say the least. Um, from an ethical perspective, I think um, in these talks, in the panels, we tend to have also legal uh, representatives speaking about copyright, uh, about machine learning, um, and it, the whole machine learning uh, behind these programs, where they take all their uh, information from, is right now being discussed in many different territories. Um, that's why we do it around the world, because each uh, area and with each territory has a different legislation. But I think um, an ongoing uh, thread in this is that 
nothing's yet fully decided. Um, but there is one thing which is still uh, is still relevant before AI, and that's similarity. So if you produce something that's far too similar to an original piece, that's going to bring up copyright infringement uh, issues, and it's ethically wrong, too. That being said, advertising, as uh, we've discussed in other talks, um, has done this for years. They've changed a chord in a song because they didn't want to pay the royalty fees for the licensing of uh, of a song that, that really went well with a car ad, whatever, no? Uh, so I think similarity uh, is similarity between what you produce with AI um, versus uh, uh, an original art piece, music piece, etc. I think that's, that's just something that every creator, every agency, every brand needs to still keep an eye on and make sure that they're not, uh, they're not um, stealing work in that way. Another thing is what these programs have been trained on, what the machine learning behind the paper, which defends the the program that's that's right now in in a kind of legal limbo um and the more that these programs develop and the more they become hybrid like photoshop is now what we all knew was uh photoshop tools and now we've got generative uh, ai on it so there's going to be more and more of these sort of ai integrations which will make it even harder for legislation pick out what is, uh, um, what's legal and what's not. And I think this is, it's going to be an ongoing conversation. And I think we just have to be respectful of other creatives work, be respectful of, uh, of copyright and, uh, and try and navigate this as best as possible. But we'll also get to that challenging point where we don't know you know, they've developed uh, an AI to police GPT papers, and uh, someone's already created an AI to circumvent the AI police. Uh, whack a mole. I mean, it's the, that's techno technological whack a mole, and it will always be that case. Like, and from maybe, uh, hopefully, this is not an unanswerable question, but from operating, from um, imagining a slightly more risk adjusted. Um, point of view from inside of a larger company. Is there any kind of things that you would say are like red flags, no nos, things that are like too much, um, too much too soon for certain uh, industries, cultures, ways of working? Like, is there anything that you have noticed, maybe not from within your team, but from within the business? I'll keep my practical hat on because uh, it's actually something that's fairly new. So um security privacy is so huge for us right we're like a 10 billion dollar company and we work with talent so name and likeness of and we're our target for whatever lawsuits all the time right we're just like a large institution so we have to be super practical about how much risk we're going to introduce with the gain of what is it? At the end of the day, if you do the calculation, if you adopt AI of any kind, what are you going to gain? Time? Scale? Okay, cool. But then it comes at the risk of like, if you introduce more volume, are the, are the more jobs QC folks? Or is it art directors who are reviewing, going back to like creation and curation? Um, and then now as a QC person, are you proofreading or are you now like a legal review? So it, it's um, a real thing that I'm dealing with currently right now. Um, I, what I can sort of like give as a gift of like my own learnings is that one of the benefits of working within an environment like Adobe, I don't know this today, but it might have changed yesterday. But my last understanding is that their generative image text to image is coming from their own pool of licensed stock imagery so you can argue it's a safe environment is it the most creative no i have actually a few slides here so if we can go to slide five i think it's interesting and i just added a new one so like let's go to slide five
every time I'm going to start talking, like it's, it's, I start talking to, to Phil and then it comes up. So caveat, this was last year, Firefly Beta. And Firefly Beta, if you're not familiar with, is an Adobe tool. And it's primarily text to image. So if you put in the word outdoor fun summer diverse party in sunny weather, which was just a regular prompt for a sort of evergreen summer marketing something, right? Well, it's really interesting what you get, like a hodgepodge of body parts. If you go to the next slide, you zoom in and you're like, wow. Okay, again, for for like to give the benefit of a doubt, I did one just right now while we were in this talk. So if you go to the next slide, just to show the advancements to be fair, I did diverse group enjoying a picnic. And so on the right side, obviously the morphing of anatomy has definitely improved from last year. But then you can also look at like the diverse, like top left, diverse group of enjoying a picnic. I mean, all male is diverse. So I'm just using this as like the blend between privacy, security, and ethics. They all are complex. And to Adam's point, depending what market you're in, you might have different like policies that you're working with. Um, so a practical answer from someone who is a high volume generation of like in market um, sensitivities of not just our brand, but also our partners, which is a lot of high profile talent, it's really hard. So right now we're trying to figure out ways in which like photo shoots in traditional sense, we would have to cast and do all that and et cetera. Could this be a solve? I'm not sure we're there yet. Um, primarily because if you want to be air quote safe, we do have to work in a walled garden like an Adobe Firefly that has pre-vetted images. But will I use that tomorrow? No. Is it fun to play with right now? Absolutely. I mean, I'm not going to pile on to the fun uh, news cycle that Google have been having this week with uh, Gemini and their approach to how they look at bias within the models, because I think they've had a slightly, <laughs> slightly different yeah. approach uh, and had some other challenges. So we're, we're coming to an end. Um, we have like two minutes left. So I'd like to give that both to you guys. Is there anything else you'd like to say to our wonderful audience? Um, one final tip, one final thought, Adam? Um, I, I just encourage everyone to go out there and have fun with it. And I think that's the best way to learn what works for you and what, and what doesn't. And then there'll be all those questions about ethics. There'll be all those questions out there. But as a source of inspiration, I think it's, it's I haven't had this much fun in a long time. Uh, and? Uh, what I would say, I'm just going to counterbalance Adam, which I'm, I'm up, I'm plus up on the one on the have fun thing. Um, if I was to gift my learnings in a practical sense, um, I would say, uh, it's okay to sit in an unknown. Like it's okay to sit with like, you don't know which first AI tool to start. It's okay that you don't really know how to use it and apply it if you're a traditional creator. It's okay if you're scared. It's also okay if you're just like hog wild and you don't know what you're doing and just, you know, your first day on Photoshop. I think we all remember that, just clicking all the filters. Um, so I would just say like, it's whatever space you're in, it's totally fine. Honor it, but I will double down on, you do need to figure out your own version of adopting it. Small or large, you got to, otherwise, I think you, you might find yourself like cornered as a commercial creative, at least. That, well, number one, you guys should just have the Adam and Anne podcast. I could listen to you both speak every week. I think I'm the person here that shouldn't be here. Um, I really want to thank you both for taking the time.